Hi, I'm Molly from horticulture.co.uk and today I'm joined by Fergus Garrett, a horticulturist and the Chief Executive of the Great Dexter Charitable Trust. Fergus, do you want to explain a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm uh, um, half Turkish, half British gardener, um, brought up in Istanbul, and so I, you know, feel very strongly about my Turkish heritage, and um, and and I started gardening you know, quite late on in life, in in many ways. You know, I didn't start as a youngster. I started in in my late sort of teens, um. And um, and then ended up at Dixter as head gardener. I've been head gardener here for thirty years, so I'm I'm first and foremost hands-on gardener. That's the really important thing. I I'd love you know being out in the garden, but of course I'm CEO of the Great Dixter Charitable Trust as well, which means that I've got a responsibility for the whole of the organisation here, which is quite quite a responsibility because it's a it's an amazing place. How did you then um, kind of venture into the world of horticulture and? And pursue that as a career. I think it's it's all down to people, really. It's it's, it's down to inspirational teachers. Um, I I never thought about doing anything that was land based until I started, you know, as a, as a young kid, started sort of reading the National Geographic magazine, and I was interested in you know uh, agriculture in West Africa and tropical Africa and places like like that. Really keen on that sort of stuff. My geography teacher at school, Mr. Baldston who was also head of the sixth form. He, he was, I mean, I really love this style of teaching. And one of the subjects he taught us was, was West African um, agriculture in West Africa. So I was fascinated by this, you know, and, uh, and I was interested in biology and chemistry and those sort of things. So, and he said to me, you ought to go to university to study something land-based and that you ought to go to a place called Y College, you know, which, is, um, which was a really well-known college between um, Canterbury and Ashford is part of London University. So I decided to, to make that leap and go to university. And my mother had moved back to Turkey by that time. So I was just with my brother and, and we had a house in Hove. You know, we just, we just, um, you know, with, he was sharing with a lot of his mates. And so it was an unusual leap for somebody from our environment to go to university, you know, because we just, you didn't, people just got jobs. They played in bands, they, you know, they, they messed around and that was it. But I actually made that leap. And, um, as a result of this one teacher. And, and so when I got to Y to study agriculture there, um, I, I just suddenly thought it's not for me, you know, because it was all about high input, high output, and it didn't sort of really fit the bill for me. Um, but it's a change, and I wanted to study rural environmental studies, basically conservation. And, and um, but my first year subjects didn't match. So my director of studies, who was great, said to me, "Why don't you do? Why don't you do horticulture? You know, that's similar to the first year subjects." And and I had to ask him what horticulture meant. I didn't even know what what it what it meant at that stage. And and so. Um, he said, no, it's gardening. And I thought, well, actually, my grandmother was a gardener. Maybe I'll, I'll, do, I'll try gardening. He said, because it's about garden history and garden design and all. Or he said, if you're creative, that would be good, good for you. You're good on soil sciences and things like that. So I, ch I swapped courses. And one thing led, led to another. And I then become, became passionately involved in it. And, and here we are. What does a kind of day working in a life look like for you? From university, I went and then worked at Brighton Parks Department, which was fantastic. You know, I loved being in the parks. And then I went and did some landscaping, and I then went and worked abroad in, in the south of France and in Switzerland and did all various jobs, and then landed at, 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 at Dixter and, and really got into this sort of, not only just the, having that stamp collector's attitude to, to knowing lots and lots of plants, but really got into the actual the the skill of gardening you know how do you make work how can you work very effectively how do you look after plants how do you grow top quality plants you know how do you grow more of them how can, you know all of that so I got involved in all and that's been my passion to actually the working side so you know and that sort of leads you on to it leads me on to that question that you asked about what was my working day involved I think the thing that 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 you know is a big part of my day is actually being out in the garden with the team I've got a really great team but we've got lots of students as well you know 
and it's a very vibrant atmosphere where you're, you know, where you're teaching, 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 you're experimenting, you're trying new things all the time. And, and so every day is exciting like that. But then there are other possibilities, other sort of responsibilities because I'm CEO. So I've got a responsibility to the finances, to the, to the, you know, the way the place is run, the sense of place, the, you know, the, because we're, we're, a, we're an organization that actually gives a lot, you know, we have a, a really diverse group of people that work for us, which is wonderful. It makes us a much richer, stronger place. And, um, we could easily run this place as some, as a place that made loads and loads of profits, you know, you know, it's, it's, we could hire it out for weddings, et cetera, all of that. We could be trying to see the, the names good, the brands good, but we don't do that. We just continue, we try and give as much as we can to the people around us, the community and people in the horticultural world. So we're constantly, you know, helping, um, kids out there or organizations out there. And so that takes a lot of work to, 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 to be like that in an organization. And, and we're proud of the way we do it, but it actually takes a lot of effort to actually be like that rather than being some, but something that's a clinical business that just, you know, it gets the gate money from people. And then, you know, that's it. You know, you all sort of have a family life, don't you? Whereas we're just giving, giving, giving. Uh, and people are giving to us as well in, in, in their own way. So it's, it's a give and receive. It's, it's just, a, and life feels good in, in a place like that. I think all of these significant places like, like Dixter, you know, well-known place, has got a responsibility to serve its community. Do you have a particular favorite memory from your time at Great Dixter? My, my most favorite memories are with Christo, with Christopher Lloyd, you know, and he was my great mentor. I, I met him through... Tom from Y College and, and, um, and I, and I thought he was a curious man, you know, I'd, I'd never seen anybody like him and he was just so focused on his plants, but also, you know, he'd invite all sorts of people for weekends. And I was one of those people that got involved, um, that got invited um, through a friend of mine, Neil Ross, who was a brilliant gardener, actually, who was a student at, at Y and Neil got invited and then I got invited as well. And so I sort of quite, it's sort of quite enjoyed that and then once i started working at dixter you know um we'd already formed a quite good friendship but it became stronger and stronger that friendship and he became like a grandfather figure like a father figure and we spent a lot of time together you know whether that was sitting on a sofa discussing plants or whether that was supporting us or us each of us through hard times or whether that was traveling together or, you know, or whether that was having a meal together. So I had sort of wonderful, wonderful memories of, of, of that man. He was a much misunderstood person, actually. He was a very gentle, kind-hearted, generous, caring person um, who sometimes put this front to, to protect himself. And so people thought he was cantankerous, but he wasn't. He was just a really... He was a beautiful person in many, many ways. And so, so, you know, the, my, my heart and soul was, is, is linked to, to this place through him, you know, memories th through him. How do you balance the kind of more traditional aspects of horticulture with the need for innovation and change, especially because of the changing conditions with the environment? First things first, Dix has never been a traditional place. You know, it's got a traditional infrastructure. It's got this sort of extraordinary building that sits in front, in the center of a, um, a six acre garden with yew hedges and whatever, but the, but, but the actual horticulture within it, the playing around with plants within it is, is always been non-conformist and always been flexible and always been innovative and exciting and changing and going forward. So that element of change has been in our blood. So, it, it, so, you know, and, and, and that was installed with, um, within me through Christo. So if something didn't do well, you, you got rid of it and grew something else. So I think so. Uh, and so rather than say that rose has been there for 50 years, it has to continue being okay. Even though it looks miserable, even though I need to pump water on it, even though, and I need to give it lots of fertilizer, even though I, you know, have to spray the living daylights every once every two weeks. So we, we did none of that. If that rose didn't, like being there and we had to put chemicals on it. We got rid of the rose and it grew something else that didn't need that sort of attention. So, you know, that was in, within Christo's style of gardening. So there was an inbuilt resilience in Christo's. So, 
and that sort of flexibility. So if, if, if we find that, um, that something doesn't do well because of the climate change, we change it without any problem at all. Okay. Um, also, uh, we never do the same thing. You know, we, we constantly experiment with no, new ideas as well. So, so out goes that sort of our tradition is to, to be experimental with it. So that's one thing. But on you, because you mentioned climate change, and I think that then moves us on to a, a sort of serious, really serious issue there. Because you know, I don't want to just answer the question by saying we're gonna we're gonna adapt to climate change by just changing the plants we grow in the garden, because that's only you know been something that we actually as have to look at ourselves as an organisation, you know, as an industry, an organisation, as a human being, as a and say. What can I do to actually make a difference here? It's not just about recycling. It's about, you know, as a consumer, what are the sort of the green ethics of the people that you're buying from? You know, who, who are you banking with? Who is your energy from? Is it green energy? Who is, who is your insurance through? You know, if you're buying clothing, like waterproof clothing for, your, for the, the team, first of all, are you buying something that is actually sustainable, you know, or is it going to be just plastic stuff that's going to be thrown back into the, into the, um, into the landfill after two years, or do you go through a co to a company? It's going to cost you more money, but do you go to a company that's absolutely sustainable and their ethics are there and so on? So we're going down that route to try and actually do something as a company to actually make a difference. It's just finding enough time to do all of it, but that's very much on our agenda to, as, as we go th through as an organization, you know. Um, so I think there are lots of changes have already been made at Dixter, but there's a lot more to make as, as well, you know, and because we don't want to say, oh, we don't use peat, we've ticked that box, we're going to use less water, we've ticked that box, I'm okay, Jack, you know, that's, we've done our bit for it. It's not about, it's about going as deep as you can into this. What are some of your favorite plants to work with and why are they your favorite? I think I like those plants that transport me to another world, whether that's a leafy forest in Vietnam or whether that's the Anatolian steppe flora or, you know, the Anatolian plateau or whether that's a bit of rock in New Zealand or somewhere like that. I think I've always been interested in plants in the wild. So if I then pick up even a pack of the seed, that, that's, you know, that comes from wherever, you know, say it came from uh, the Pontic Alps. It transports me to the Pontic Alps. You know, I've been to the Pontic Alps, but I haven't been to Vietnam and I haven't been to, you know, many other places, but I, I like sort of, I like that element of fantasy in a, in a, in a garden. So, um, so those plants that sort of evoke a certain place, but also those plants that are architectural, that actually have a certain amount of character to them, that, that actually can make a real you know, the real sort of punchiness, in, have elements of punchiness in a border, like Bomeri and Verbacina, Macrophila, you know, things when it, even whether it's Yucros or Bechenarias or Fucreas, you know, Melianthus Major, Aranda Donax, you know, all those sort of architectural plants I love. Euphorbia Caracius, Wolf and Eyes, are looking wonderful at the moment with Plectranthus Argentatus. And, and then I love that the, the um, the black par black seeded parsley, melanosalinum decipiens, because it looks like a massive cabbage tree, and those things that excite you like like that are are, are terrific. But then there are other things, you know. I think touching the scent of winter sweet, chimenanthus praecox in the in the winter that takes me back to Christo. Those moments with Christo having those meals where he had a, a, a you know a twig of winter sweet on them in the middle of the table. You know those things that when I um, get close to a fuchsia, I think of my grandmother, you know, and, you know, when I, when I, when I see Tulipa Sprenger, I think about Anatolia, you know, I, when I, when I see giant fennel, I think about the walls, uh, of, around Istanbul that where they grow out of the cracks, the old city walls and so on and so on. So, so, you know, plants do many, many things. And for me, it's not just about the combination, but it's about the memories that they bring or, uh, the the fantasy that they, 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 you know, they, they catalyze in your mind, all of those things are, are extraordinary. Is there any fundamental advice you'd give to someone who's maybe just starting out their journey in gardening? Try and work in a garden where they're going to teach you, you know, where you can stand alongside, where you're going to have people who are going to help you on your way. 
there's loads of inspirational people out there that are, that are helping people left, right, and center. So that's one thing. Go to a place that takes that responsibility of teaching you, um, seriously and then work hard for them. And then you'll, they'll open doors for you in many ways. Try and go and see plants in the wild if you can. Everybody sort of focuses on garden design, but actually, um, the best garden designers have a real knowledge of, you know, people like Dan Pearson have a real knowledge of what goes on in the wild as well. So that they, they have real movement in the way they put, um, put, put things together. I think also be really aware. And I think the younger generation are aware, be really aware of the envir environment and the planet and sustainability and, and all of that and biodiversity, you know, so it, it just, we shouldn't be gardening with chemicals. You know, the industry shouldn't be using herbicides and pesticides and all of those things. So be really, really aware, aware of that, that you want to, you want to have best practice, uh, you know, because we've done enough of that in the, in the past. So that's really quite important. Um, read, um, observe, visit gardens, find somewhere where you're going to enjoy the people and enjoy the work, work hard. That's really important. Learn and read, be really sensitive to the environment that you're working in. Where do you see the future of horticulture heading? Is there anything you're kind of anticipating in the future? Well, I think there are lots of young, exciting young people coming up in horticulture. And, and I think styles of planting are changing, but they'll always change. But I think the, in, the exciting thing about, um, the, the, the new generation is that, that some of them are sort of approached as my assistant head gardener, Coralie said to me, people are getting into horticulture because they're, they're, they're approaching it from an environmental thing. You know, they're, they're thinking, they're thinking about the environment, about helping to save the planet and you know, so they're getting into the green world as a result of, of, of that, which I think is really great that that's become a main part of the focus. It's not just about, it's not just about designing with plants and designing gardens and all of that. So there's, there's, so, so there's a much more sort of holistic approach now. So I, I think, so I think there's, there's people coming into horticulture. I think the wages in, within horticulture have to go up so that, that, you know, it, it's, it's not. It's always has been looked at as an, as a low paid occupation, but I think that is changing as well. And it should change really faster than that so that people can think I put my career, you know, I can, I can make a career out, out of that. I think the future involves being taking real notes of sustainability and biodiversity and the environment. I think that's really, I think that people are much more savvy about, about that and whether or not the, the planting is formal or informal, it doesn't matter as long as you're not spraying the living daylights out of your, you know, so I think sustainability is going to be big on the, the issue. So I think there is a, there is a future. I think that there has to be large adaptations within the industry to, uh, and within gardens. You're going to have to, you're going to have to adapt to climate change for sure. You know, um, there's going to have to be that flexibility in plant use and the way we go about it. We have to find ways, um, of of everything from putting shows together to, to, um, to growing vegetables, to, to, uh, to running a garden. We have to find ways of doing that in a more sustainable way as, as well. There's going to be a greater sort of blurring of the lines between horticulture and ecology as well. That's going to be, happen in the future. And I think also, and it should be happening more and more is that, that sort of horticulture, ecology, creative ecology, whatever you call it. It's going to be, hopefully it will be running through our, our towns and cities as well to actually make our towns and cities more biodiverse and more sustainable and better for, you know, better use of water, stop them flooding, give people greater access to, 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 to places where they, you know, they can have increased well being. you know, there's more oxygen in there. So just places where people can meet or people can eat, you know, and people can sit down and grow things, you know, I think more and more of that human element is going to be um, important rather than having just private garden, private garden, private garden. I think just to open up all of that so that people can min mingle and the whole thing becomes porous is going to be quite important as well. Where can our viewers reach you if they want to know more about you or about Great Dexter? They can look on my Instagram, Fergus Mustafa Sabri Garrett, you know, Fergus Mustafa, all one word, or they can go on to Great Dexter Official. 
Instagram. They can easily sort of message through there or they can email me at Dixter. You know, they can look on our website as well. They can come and visit. In terms of the industry, the future looks great. You know, it, there's lots of really great people doing interesting things that are stretching the way people think um, in this industry. We used to be quite inward looking in, in, in British culture. No, I think it's, that's changing. And that's changing with those new generations that are coming along that are doing great stuff, inner city stuff and great design work and, and good gardening going on.